This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at Steven Spielberg's remake of the classic musical, West Side Story. Director Guillermo del Toro's film noir, Nightmare Alley, starring Bradley Cooper. The new animated tale, Encanto, featuring songs by Lin-Manuel Miranda, and Cyrano, a new musical take on the timeless unrequited love story, Cyrano de Bergerac, starring Peter Dinklage. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rosen. Welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly critic roundtable show where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me today are Bill McCuddy from Gold Derby. Hey there, Bill. Hi, Neil. Don't sell that computer. For some reason, it's making you look younger. Jack Rico's here from Showbiz Cafe. Hey, Jack. Happy 2022, Neil. Happy 22 to you. And returning to the show, our pal Rafer Guzman from Newsday. Hey there, Rafer. Neil, good to see you. Good to see you. Let's start out with a look at several new films in theaters and or streaming, beginning with the new version of West Side Story. Let's take a look at a clip. Tonight, tonight, it all began tonight. I saw you on the whirlwind away. Tonight, tonight, there's only you tonight. What do you want? What do you do? What do you say? Today, all day, I had the feeling a miracle would happen. I know now I was wrong. Jack, tell us about West Side Story. All right, Neil. Well, this is directed by Steven Spielberg, and it's been readapted by Tony Kushner. And this retelling of the 1961 original stars Ansel Elgort, uh, Rachel Zegler, Ariana DeBose, David Alvarez, Mike Feist, and the return of Rita Moreno in a brand new role. So many people came into this film asking why we needed a remake of one of the greatest musicals of all time. Well, for Spielberg, it was about amending the whitewashing of the Puerto Rican characters from the original and bringing authenticity to the Puerto Rican and New York Rican experience. He cast 20 real Puerto Ricans, allowed the characters to speak Spanish without subtitles, and gave screen time to La Borinquena, which is a Puerto Rican anthem. Spielberg preserves all the nostalgic elements of the 60s original while making it a little bit more grittier and more realistic. Ariana DeBose, who plays Anita, is a revelation and she picks up the mantle where Rita Moreno left off. She's a triple threat, Neil, who will most likely pick up a Best Supporting Actress by the Academy. I feel that this is a movie that still has something to say about racism and violence in America. Rafer. Yeah, you know, I was not prepared to, uh, to really like this very much. I didn't really see a need for them to make, to remake the movie. I've always liked the original. It's got that kind of cool corny feel that makes it timeless. I didn't really think we needed a new West Side Story, but I was really stunned at what a great big screen experience this was. Um, Spielberg it directs this movie like he's 21. It's like he's directing it like it's his first movie. He's got something to prove. He's like the young, hungry kid. Every single scene in this film was just like this eye-popping, great dance number where he's using shadows in this really interesting way. It's just, it's so dramatic, so vibrant. And like Jack said, you know, it's the immigrants, uh, the the uh, the nativists versus the American immigrants. Again, it's this the same old argument. It feels fresh um, and it doesn't feel quaint this time. It's a much tougher retelling of the of the old movie. And I, I was I was floored by it, Bill. Well, this is in my top 10. I'm glad we're giving it a push here because it didn't make as much money as everybody thought it was going to. But I think this is an incredible film. And it also talks about gentrification. I don't think if you ever come to New York, you're not from around here or you are and you drive by Lincoln Center or walk by Lincoln Center, you'll never do it the same way again. This is an incredible, well-told story that everyone said, why are they doing it again? And now we see why. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I cringed when I heard they were remaking this unbelievable movie and they actually improved upon the original. I mean, first of all, Spielberg recreated 1950s New York, even down to like the street signs of the right color. I mean, everything is just like spot on. But beyond that, I mean, I agree with you, Jack. I mean, instead of having white people play the sharks, I mean, they have authentic Puerto Rican actors in there. And I think that's great. The choreography is dazzling. The costumes are beautiful. And it really, they add more depth to the story. I mean, in the original, the Jets got way more screen time than the, than the Sharks, and here it's equal time, and there's great backstories on them. Listen, before he, he passed, 
the late Stephen Sondheim said he saw it and said it was great. And I'm sure if Jerome Robbins and Leonard Bernstein were alive, they probably would say the same thing. I think this thing is bound for the Oscars and I think it's well-deserved. I think it's terrific. All right, let's move on. Rayford, tell us about a movie called The Lost Daughter. All right, this is the story of a woman named Leda. She's a college professor, late 40s. She's played by the great Olivia Coleman. Uh, she comes to Greece for a vacation, a little sun, a little relaxation. But there's another family on the island, a young mother played by Dakota Johnson and her little girl. And something about these two starts to trigger some unhappy memories for Leda. And little by little, as the movie unfolds in flashbacks, we start to piece together the story of Leda and her own daughters, and it is not a pretty story. Uh, this is the directorial debut of Maggie Gyllenhaal, uh, one of my favorite actresses, and it's based on the novel by Elena Ferrante, the author behind the famous Neapolitan novels. Um, I like this movie a lot. It is uh, in my top 10, not way high. I have a few little reservations about it, but on the plus side, the acting is terrific. Uh, Coleman is just fantastic in the role. Although I will say a lot of the Oscar talk is about Olivia Coleman. I'd really love to see something go to Jesse Buckley who plays the yes. young Zeta. I thought she was like the star of the show and really compelling. This is one of those movies, it's a little slow. It's what we critics like to call thoughtful. Uh, but I think if you can concentrate on it and really get into it, it's very rewarding and a very powerful film. Bill McCuddy. Well, I agree with all the flashback scenes. In fact, I thought Olivia Coleman was brave to take the uh, role on when I saw how good she was being portrayed at a younger age. But I think the real headline in all of this, and I'm happy it's in your top 10 list, it didn't make mine, but that Maggie Gyllenhaal is a, an accomplished new director to watch, but also a really, really good screenwriter. This, this script is very tight. You're right about the direction being a little loose and it, it almost seems sloppy in places. No, those are the nuances of a great director. And I think we're going to see a lot more work from her in the future. Jack? Well, you know, I believe that Maggie Gyllenhaal gives us all the beauty and ugliness of motherhood in this film. I think the subject matter is still taboo in society. And it's refreshing to see Hollywood exploring these subject matters that are very hard to discuss today. Look, this year alone, we've seen several mothers in distress films, such as Pedro Almodovar's Parallel Mothers, uh, Pablo Larraín Spencer with Kristen Stewart, just to name two. So I'm glad that Hollywood is finally opening up to exploring a lot of these taboo subjects. Well, I couldn't disagree with all three of you any more than this. I think this is such an overrated film and it's boring. I mean, the main character is not only unlikable, I didn't care for any of the characters here. You know, she's at a Greek resort and some kid is, little kid is freaking out that her doll is missing. She steals the doll for some unexplicable, unexplainable reason. Then, if making things worse, it, there's an ending, which I won't reveal, that it, it totally doesn't make any sense. And through <laughs> the flashbacks, we're supposed to say, okay, well, she had trouble as a young woman juggling her career and motherhood. Big yes. deal. It doesn't account for her screwball you know, actions in the present. The film's not only boring, it's frustrating. It has a lot of ambiguity and makes very little sense. I think the performances are good, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I was bored to tears and so was my wife. Let's switch gears here and talk about a neo film noir. I hope I'm getting the genre of this correctly. Bill, Nightmare Alley. I'm as stunned as everyone else that you did get that correct, Neil. Uh, I would call it Night Noir Mare Alley because this is uh, Guillermo del Toro's like remake of a kind of noirish film, and it's extremely stylish. We have uh, Bradley Cooper as a carny who learns mind reading from Tony Collette and David Stratham, and then hits the road or the alley for the big con with Rooney Mara. Kate Blanchett absolutely mesmerizes, literally, but don't get too excited by all this because it ends in tears. Uh, all I can say is, what a ride, and I can't recommend it highly enough. It's in my Jack. top 10 list. Jack? Well, I'm kind of mixed about this uh, movie, uh, Neil. Um, I, I like the cast, I like the performances, I like the unsettling atmosphere but it did drag a lot for me. And I wasn't crazy about the ending either. It's a slow burn whose highlight is only Kate Blanchett and Bradley Cooper when they come together halfway throughout the film. Visually, it's a sight to see, but I don't think this is one of Del Toro's best films. Rafer? Oh, I really think it is one of his best. Uh, I was really bowled over by this. I think um, Del Toro is like one of these few filmmakers that really understands how uh, movies kind of function like dreams. And when you're in one of his movies, it just feels like you're lost in, in someone else's and your own subconscious. And of course, you know, Del Toro's subconscious is an extremely dark place to be. 
Bill, you were saying it ends in tears. It just, it's much worse than tears, isn't it? Um, it's a pretty dark, dark movie. And I think that might turn a lot of people off, but um, like, uh, I think we're all agreeing here that visually th there's really very, very little to compare to it this year. I thought this was terrific. You know, this is a remake of an old black and white movie, but Guillermo del Toro makes it its own. I mean, you look at this in every frame of this movie, which it's brilliantly shot, you just know you're watching a Guillermo del Toro film. All the performances are great. Bradley Cooper is terrific. The more I see of Bradley Cooper, I realize what a chameleon-like actor he is. I mean, he could just do anything. If you compare this to his performance in Licorice Pizza, I mean, it's a complete 180. I did see the ending coming, you know, way in advance, but it doesn't really matter. Listen, as far as a film noir goes, it's stylish, it's well acted, it's very involving, and it has an engrossing storyline with some cool twists and turns. It's certainly more than enough here to make it worth your while to watch. I, I highly recommend it. Cyrano is a new musical version of the classic tale Cyrano de Bergerac starring Peter Dinklage. Let's take a look at a clip. I could no more stop loving you. I could no more stop loving you. Then I could stop the sun rising. Then I can stop the sun rising. Really? My cruel love has never stopped growing in my soul. From the day it was born there. From the day it was born. There. There! If your love is cruel, you should have killed it. I tried. It has the strength of Hercules. I tried! It has the strength of... Hercules. Hercules! Bill, tell us about Cyrano. Well, as you mentioned, Peter Dinklage is both a wordsmith and a swordsman, and in this story, which we've seen before, I don't think has been handled as deftly it has, as it has this time. Peter Dinklage is amazing. The conceit, not that he has a big nose, but that he's very insecure about his height. And uh, that hinders dating Roxanne, in this case, uh, the luminous Haley Bennett, uh, who's in lust with Kevin Harrison Jr. This is not one of those wall-to-wall -wall musicals that will make you say, oh, do I really want to watch a musical? It's from the very capable hands of director Joe Wright, who is probably mea culpa for last year's horrid Woman in the Window. But he's been in uh, period uh, comfort before with the Darkest Hour, Pride and Prejudice, and Atonement. So sit back, relax, and enjoy one of the best performances of the year in Peter Dinklage. I hope he gets an Oscar nomination. Jack? Well, you know, I don't think that this is the best version of the Serrano story uh, and the movies that have been made about it, but it's different and charming enough to bring a smile to your face. And I think it's time that, like uh, Bill said, we all acknowledge that Peter Dinklage as one of the best actors working right now. He carries this film. It's his film, and I hope to see him in many more lead roles in the future. Rafer. Yeah, I was a little mixed on this one, and I was trying to figure out why, because like everybody else here, I think Peter Dinklage is just fantastic in the role. Um, he's got such an expressive face. He's got those eyebrows that kind of go all over the place. He's just, he's such a great actor. Uh, I think my problem with it was, as Bill said, it's, it's not quite a full-on musical. You rarely see anything that is a full-fledged musical number. You get sort of snippets, a little refrain, a, a, a line, a chorus here and there, uh, and there are great visuals to go along with it, but something about that felt a little half-baked to me, and I wanted a little more out of the musical component of the film. I, I agree. I don't think the music, no, musical numbers are the main component in the film, but I think they add something to the movie. I, I think Peter Dinklage, as again, we've all said, is terrific. He, he's the center of the film and he's terrific. He displays a wide range of emotions. And, um, you know, the production design here is first rate. And I like what director Joe Wright did with this tale that has been told in countless of other movies. And this is a new twist on it. And I like the fact that they abandoned the nose thing and, and went for the height thing. And, you know, it, it makes it a little different. And I think the whole thing works. Next up, I'm tipping something off. This is one of my favorite movies of the year. It's called Coda. And Rafer, why don't you tell everybody about it? Sure. This is a coming of age story uh, about Ruby. She's a high school girl in Gloucester, Massachusetts. It's a fishing town, very working class. Ruby is a little shy, but she's got this great singing voice and she decides she wants to share it with the world and become a singer. But she's got two problems. Uh, one is that her family runs a fishing boat and they need her help to bring in fish so they can survive. And two, her family is deaf. Uh, CODA, the title, stands for Child of Deaf Adults. So even though Ruby has this uh, emotional connection to music that we can feel, her family doesn't. And they kind of can't understand why she wants to leave them to do something that for them is kind of non-existent. 
It is formulaic, but it just worked like a charm on me. Uh, Amelia Jones, who plays Ruby, such a winner. You'd never know she was British. Uh, she's 19. She feels like a real teenager. And her family is played by three deaf actors, Daniel Durant as her brother, uh, Troy Kutzer as her dad, and of course, Marley Matlin, who we all know as her mother. But everyone in the living room, my sons, my wife, myself, we were all choked up by the end. It just, it, it won us over hook, line, and sinker. And I, I fell for it. I loved it. I loved it too. Jack, go ahead. It's one of the feel-good films of the year, if not one of the better ones. It's a tearjerker you see coming a mile away, yet it still manages to pierce through you. Uh, but not many people uh, are discussing how Mexican actor Eugenio Derbez, for me, stole almost every scene he's he was great. in. I, he's, he's he was great. fantastic. Absolutely. I think if you're looking for a film that can put a smile on your face, I think Coda delivers on that. Bill? Well, I wanted to like this. I heard all the buzz that you guys heard, and, and I thought it was going to be a lot better than it was, but it really ends up being kind of a Disney film, except for the exception of a scene at the end where she goes in for an audition and her parents are there. Other than that, that scene got me. Everything else you will see coming each scene, the next one, over and over and over. It's so predictable. It should be called Co. Duh! We know what's going to uh, happen. Have yet. a heart. Have a heart, Bill. Ooh, Bill, you're heartless. I love this. I wanted to, but uh, I can't recommend it. There's nothing wrong with formulaic if the formula is done well. 90% of movies are taken are, are reminiscent of other movies. This movie got me. First of all, Amelia Jones, it's a star-making performance from her. I mean, not only did she have to learn sign language, and as you said, Raper, she's British, she also had to learn how, how to work a fishing boat. She's just incredible. And, um, you know, she also conveys all these different emotions. It's so much to rest on a teenager's shoulders. I mean, she has to get up at like four in the morning to make sure she's the only one who can hear in the family that they get into the boat. It's a fishing family and that she, they could sell the fish and she's half asleep when she goes to school. And of course they can't understand the parents when she's offered, you know, she has a chance to get a scholarship for her vocal talents in, you know, at, at a prestigious music school because they can't hear and they don't understand that. And I think all the performances are great. And I agree with you, Jack, that um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but Eugenio Derbez as this, you know, tough as nail, you know, school teacher that really has a heart of gold. He's great. The, the father, um, Troy Couture, he's terrific. Of course, Molly Matlin's always great. I love this film. It moved me. And even though I knew what was coming, it did not matter. There was a twist on this formula being that the fact that it was ch a child of deaf adults. And by the way, coda has a double meaning. If you know anything about music, coda is also means an end of a piece of music. It's also an end to a part of this teenager's life as she start, tries to start a new chapter. But this fires on all cylinders. It's wonderful. Again, on my top 10 list of the year and very high up on that list. Jack, I want you to tell us about the worst person in the world, which is by the way, not Bill McCuddy, even though he didn't like Coda, <laughs> but it's the name of the new movie and tell us about it. <laughs> well, this is one of my favorite films of the year, Neil. Uh, it's directed and written by Joaquin Trier and starring Renata Rinesvay, Anders Danielson, Lee and Herbert Nordrum. Uh, and the story centers around a young Scandinavian woman who confronts a series of existential crises as she closes in on 30. This is one of the best coming of age romantic dramas of the year and Rhinesvay delivers a star performance. The film tries to answer questions about who should we be by 30? What happens when we love someone but then fall out of love with them? Should we settle for things in life? It's an overwhelming amount of choices life gives us. So how does one know what the right choice is? Now, the film doesn't necessarily try and answer all of these questions, but it does triumph in the creative ways of exploring the difficulties of attaining a clear identity of who one should be. Rafer? Um, uh, I have to agree. I, I really love this. Um, I, I regret to say I had to watch this on my laptop. Uh, and when I saw that it was broken into 12 or 13 little chapters, which the film tells you at the beginning, I thought, oh, great. You know, I'll, I'll watch a little here and there, take a break, <laughs> watch a few more. And I was just totally riveted. I was sucked in. I watched the entire thing all the way through. I couldn't believe how good it was. <laughs> I will say, uh, Renata Reinsve, if I'm, I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, such a great choice for this role. I wasn't familiar with her, but she's she's perfect. She's got this face that's kind of beautiful, but also kind of childlike at the same time. Uh, you know, she's sexy, but she's not a bombshell. And, you know, there are these moments when I was watching it thinking like, oh yeah, if that girl broke up with you, you'd never survive it. You might not live. <laughs> 
She's just fantastic. She's just so captivating on the part. I love this movie. I wish I'd seen it before I made my official top 10. It probably would have been number two or number three. It's amazing. Bill? Well, my only question is, is she the worst person in the world? Is she worse than Neil? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I like and admire this film, and I think she's really good in it. But one of the things that everyone likes that I'm sort of on the fence about is the road it takes between comedy and drama, back and forth and back and forth. Uh, she doesn't do anything that bad. She's seeing two guys at the same time. That makes her the worst person in the world. This is an actress to look out for, uh, but it's not one of the 10 best movies of the year, in my opinion. Well, again, Bill, uh, you're not on the same page with the three of us. Uh, I think this is a terrific film. I think Renata uh, Reinsva is phenomenal. And um, yes, yeah, she thinks she's the worst person in the world because she's having the affair. She's not, but she's only 29 years old. And she's not supposed to have her whole everything figured out in life. And I think that's one of the points of this movie. I mean, she she, she crashes a wedding, which is hysterical. She's walking by a wedding, and there's another guy in there who's also involved with somebody else. And they go out of their way. Well, let's see. If I touch your hair, we're not really cheating, are we? You know, if I blow smoke from my uh, cigarette into your mouth, we're not. We didn't really cheat. I mean, it's just such a human film. And I just think the performances are so natural. She's great. I couldn't agree with you more, Ray, for on, yeah, she's not a bombshell, but she's, there's something about her. And the whole movie is just, the, the director just really captures this whole thing that's, if you describe it as in something like, wow, what an incredible story. It's a human story. It's a character study and it's terrific. It's really well done. What could I do if I just threw what I was feeling in? a clip from Encanto. It's Jack Rico's personal choice as we go around the panel with our critics picks of the month. Jack. I like the way you said Encanto, uh, Neil. You're, you're, you're a Latino for me, all right? Yeah. And uh, as a Colombian myself. I'll try eating Encanto. <laughs> Encanto. There been. you go. Okay. I like the way you said. <laughs> well, you know, as a Colombian myself, Encanto makes it into my top 10 films of 2021. It has music from Lin-Manuel Miranda, and it centers around a Colombian family gifted with magical powers, except for Mirabel, who goes on a quest to save her family when their home's magic begins to fade. Look, I think this is an achievement in Latino representations, particularly in Afro-Latino representation. Uh, and it's currently the number one album on Billboard, which just might give Lin-Manuel Miranda the Oscar he needs to achieve EGOT status. He's one Oscar away. Will this movie give it to him? I know what your pick is, Ray, for sticking on a musical theme, but this is very different kind of music. Tell, tell everybody your pick. It's a slightly different film. Uh, it's a documentary by <laughs> Todd Hitchens on the Velvet Underground. Uh, and I think this is basically the first real documentary that's ever been done on this legendary uh, pioneering avant-garde band. Um, if you don't know them, they were basically a group of weirdos led by Lou Reed, who broke out during the 1960s, got involved with Andy Warhol, who became their manager and their producer, uh, and really helped launch their career. I like to think of the Velvet Underground as sort of a rebellion against a rebellion. You had the 1960s, which were all about peace and love and flower power. Then you had the Velvets who were singing about heroin and depression and death. And that's what I love about them. And this is not really like a straightforward documentary that's gonna give you a lot of backstory on every single person and uh, names, dates, places. It's really sort of following the art, you know, how, how one form of music begets another form of music. And that will beget a whole different form of music really interesting, connected a lot of dots that I uh, had not known about. And um, I just thought it was really interesting, uh, fun documentary on a band that I sort of knew, but was not that familiar with. All right, Bill McCuddy is gonna tell us his pick, which I'm, su I'm assuming you like your pick since you didn't like anything else. Um, almost no, 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 I'm not too impressed with what I picked this week. No, <laughs> I really am. It's, uh, it's called Red Rocket. It's finding its way uh, into a lot of top 10 lists. It wasn't in mine, but it's definitely one of the favorite films I saw last year. Sean Baker is a very talented uh, writer director. He brought us Tangerine and The Florida Project. He uh, He's never boring and he's never drab. He uses color in a way that almost no one, at least at this budget level, is doing. This is about a porn star played by Simon Rex. 
the, or the real life Simon Rex was a former MTV VJ. He hasn't made much in the way of great movies until this thing. He comes back to a Texas hometown that hates him. And like a rocket, he shoots for a comeback. He woos a donut shop girl into his world while selling weed from his hip ride, a girl's bicycle. This is a hard R. Don't be turned off for that reason. It is all Simon Rex, and I can't recommend it more. Well, my pick this month is How To with John Wilson, which is a quirky documentary comedy series, which recently dropped its second season on HBO. Now, Wilson's a smart, nebbishy New York filmmaker with a very keen eye who captures seemingly mundane things in life and makes them quite funny. Each episode covers a different topic, and my favorite is How To Find A Space, which hilariously looks at the horrific trials and tribulations of finding street parking in New York City. It'll not only make you laugh, it's incredibly accurate. Uh, other episodes look at why some people cover their furniture in plastic, how to make the perfect risotto, or why there's so much scaffolding in the city, which is something I never really thought about, but after watching this, I'm now enlightened. Most of the episodes go off on interesting off-topic tangents, but the brilliance of this series is Wilson's unique disarming style, which gets people to talk to him, and his humorous use of footage on the streets of the city, including shots of unsuspecting New Yorkers doing weird things, which perfectly syncs up with his narration. I think only true New Yorkers will fully appreciate this. And it's not only fun, it also frequently offers up some food for thought. Listen, check one short, short episode. They're only 25 minutes. I believe you'll be hooked. Well, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank Bill McCuddy, Ray for Guzman, and Jack Rico. I'm Neil Rosen. Join us next time. Fingers crossed back in the studio on Talking Pictures. Bye.